Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope that you're all well and uh, that you've had a, a, a good week and survived another week under these restrictions that we're under. And for anyone who's uh, tuning in today who does not, is not part of the church in the past, I'm Pete Lloyd, I'm the minister of Cretton Baptist Church and you're very welcome and it's great to have you here joining with us this morning. Let's pray for just a moment and get our hearts and our minds settled before God. Father God, we thank you for this last week. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And we pray now that you open our hearts as we come to worship you together. Amen. I've uh, been reading a book this week about the Welsh Revival in 1904. It's eyewitness accounts and just fantastic things that happen. And I know that there are many people who believe that we're on the verge of another Christian revival where God would move in a great way and uh, we would see a, a lot of people coming to know Jesus. And it's my prayer that that is where we're heading. And uh, we would all have a part in that. God would want us to be part of that. And uh, it, revival begins with us with us, each one of us being revived. And we're going to listen to a, a Graham Kendrick song, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. And it's really a prayer. And it's Lord, revive us, revive us again. And then when we finish listening to that song, Anna uh, is going to go straight into leading us into a time of prayer. gathering the fire of judgment burns how we have fallen oh lord you stand upon to see your laws of love so scorned and life so broken have mercy lord forgive us lord restore us lord Revive your church again Let justice flow Like rivers And righteousness Like a never failing stream Oh Lord Over the nations now Where is the dove of peace The wings are broken triumphant in this land 
evil confounding through the fire. Your suffering church display the glories of the Christ. Praise as resounding. Have mercy, Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Lord, we praise you and we thank you for being our great Father. You are the sole creator of this amazing world and all the people, the nations of this world, are yours. For at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. You are great and your name should be exalted amongst the nations in our communities and in our homes. Have mercy, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, at this time of crisis, we humbly pray for revival for all the nations of this earth. Lord, send your power to the north, south, east and west and incline your people to submit to your sovereign will. Revive us, Lord, as we call upon your name and let your anointing rest on us again. Pour out your Holy Spirit like never before and send your people out to declare and spread your word to your glory, honour and majesty. We pray that you will hear the heart of your people who are yearning for your presence. Forgive us, Lord, that we have not always served you or listened to you, your voice, but instead have gone our own way. Lord, this generation repents for every foolish, unjust and wicked action. Have mercy on us, Lord. Turn the hearts of the people in our nation back to you. Send revival fire. In this generation, restore our land and release your Holy Spirit power to heal hearts, homes and communities. We pray for all world governments, anoint the nation's leaders with wisdom and touch their hearts so they would look to you for strength and counsel. We pray earnestly that our government would become alert to the spiritual needs of our nation, that they would not neglect their own, nor the spiritual health of the people, but would be drawn towards you, Lord. We bring the sick to you, Lord, May you and your mercy provide comfort and hope to them and solace for their families and friends at this distressing time. Lord, bless all with your abiding presence and strength. We pray for the bereaved at this time and we especially think of people in our own village who have recently died. David Bromage and Terry Meacham's partner to name two. May they rest in peace and their families be given the comfort they need. We thank you, Lord, for the NHS frontline workers and all carers and hospital chaplains. We pray that you would protect and strengthen them. Nurture them spiritually, Lord. Provide healing springs. Let miracles, signs and wonders flow as a witness to your mighty healing power 
at work amongst the people and especially in hospitals at this time and care homes. We pray for our young people in our communities who may be anxious and a bit lost in these uncertain times, especially as they cannot meet with their families and friends, nor do they know what the future holds for them or whether they can go to university or college as they had planned. We pray blessing and loving support over them and that the right opportunities and friends come their way. May your body of believers be instrumental in leading them to you, Jesus, so that they may come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. We pray for our own churches and community in Gretton. We earnestly ask that you would cleanse, heal and renew us individually and as a body. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit and reignite our desire to serve and honour you as we should. All praise, honour, dominion and power belong to you. And as we reach towards you, Lord, let your name be lifted high, Jesus, in our community and in our homes. Let justice flow like rivers and righteousness like a never failing stream. Come, Lord Jesus, and revive your church again. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> um, now, next week is going to be a little bit different. Um, I will not be here. I will... Well, I'll be here, but uh, Richard Greasley, who many of you know, uh, who's a wonderful speaker, will be preaching next Sunday, so I will be able to, to listen in. But I am thinking about for the following Sunday, you know, I believe that God will be touching many of you and speaking to many of you during this time. And for the following Sunday, so in two weeks' time, it would be great if uh, one or two people were willing to um, take part in the service and, and share what God has been saying to you. And things that you know God has been doing in the lives of people around you, uh, just to encourage us all. I would ask you to remember that the services are recorded and so whatever you say could well go out onto YouTube. Uh, so it would need to be something that you were quite happy with doing that. But do think about it, do pray about it, and then do let me know, because it would be great to, to be hearing these things and knowing what God is doing. And one of the great things that God is doing is helping us to get us to understand technology. And uh, Carol has had many issues with technology, but uh, she's here with us today and she's going to do the reading for us. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Right, uh, the reading is from John chapter 7, starting at verse 11 to 24. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honour for himself. But he who works for the honour of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you are all astonished. 
Yet because Moses gave you circumcision through, at the, although actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarch, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now, if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath, not judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment? Thank you very much, Carol, and it is good to have you with us, and uh, particularly without any problems at your end with the technology. Yeah, well, um, yeah, a bit iffy. <laughs> Okay. okay, but thank you, Carol. Um, so we just to recap that uh, we've been going through John's Gospel and we've reached this point, and there is uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles, which was something that every man, every Jewish man, was expected to go to every year. I can't think of an equivalent uh, in our culture where every man is expected to to go somewhere or, or do something during the year, but that was the case here. Every Jewish man was expected to go to this festival. And uh, it was a time when they would be thinking about all the things that God had done for them. And Jesus has said to his, to his disciples and his family, you go, it's not the right time for me to go yet. So they had all gone. But then Jesus, a little while later, had followed on. And because every man was expected to go, people are looking for him, which is why we have in verse 11, we have people saying, uh, where is that man? They were looking everywhere for him. They, they would have been looking for him to hear the things that he had to say and the things that they knew that he could do. And they're saying, where is that man? Where is Jesus? And People cry out like that today when they feel that their life is empty and they're looking for meaning and they're saying, well, where is God in all of this? If there is a God, why haven't I met with him? And they look at things that happen throughout the world, terrible tragedies that happen. Where was Jesus when that happened? Where was Jesus when I was being bullied at school? Where was Jesus when someone I loved died prematurely? Where was Jesus when that young man had a car accident? Where is Jesus in this virus? Where was Jesus during the tsunami that, that hit the shores of um, parts of the world a few years ago? Where is Jesus in all of this? And they're crying out because they want to know where he is and they want to hear what he's got to say and they want to see what he's got to do. And people now during this time of the virus, many people are saying, well, where is God in all of this? What is going on? How come God is allowing this? Or in some cases, how, why has God sent this? Something which I don't believe. But people are still asking the question, where is Jesus? Where is he in whatever is going on? And the thing that I want you to know today is whatever the circumstances that you are in, whatever the circumstances that you may be facing, Jesus is there. During terrible times of tragedy, Jesus is there. When things go wrong in the world and we don't understand why, we don't understand why things are happening, Jesus is there. Jesus is always there. For people who are, who are not Christians who may be listening to this, this may be news to you, but you need to know that Jesus is right there with you right now. Jesus is always beside us, whatever is going on. Even in those darkest of circumstances, Jesus is right there. There will be times when we can't see him because we're looking in the wrong direction. We're looking for the wrong things, maybe. We're expecting different things. Or maybe that we're doing things in our lives which mean that we are, have cut ourselves off from him. And then we expect him to suddenly uh, be very visible to us. But whatever is going on in your life right now, and you may be facing loneliness, you may be facing hurt from bereavement, hurt from things that people have said or they've done or haven't done. 
You may be facing confusion about different things. You need to know that Jesus is right there. For people who are Christians, and you will know this, you, you know that Jesus has never left you. You will have many testimonies where Jesus has been right there beside you during the darkest of times. He's always been beside you before and he is beside you right now. Do you know, one of the things that we, we do sometimes is we think of Jesus in the way that we think of other people. We, judge, we think of him as doing things that we know other people have done, whereas Jesus is not like other people because he's the son of God. A few years ago, I uh, arranged to meet a friend for lunch and uh, I'd known him for many years and I met him and uh, I didn't know until I got there that this man was absolutely broken, completely broken, his life torn to shreds. And I'd never seen him cry before, but he sobbed. And he reached a point talking to him where I knew I'd got to go. There was somewhere else that I'd, I'd got to be and it was important. And I knew too that there wasn't much more that I could say to this man. And in the end, I, I said to him, look, I, I, I'm going to have to go. But there is one who will be right there beside you. And no matter how good a friend we may try to be to someone, we cannot be with them all the time and we will have to get up and go. And that does not apply to Jesus Christ. There is never a point when he will say to you, look, do you know what? I've done all I can for you. I've said everything that I can say to you. I'm off now. Never. Never. Never will he look at you and say, look, this is, this is of your own doing. You've made a right horlicks of the whole situation yourself. And actually, you don't really deserve me to be here with you. Never. If you imagine the closest friend you've ever had who's stuck with you through thick and thin, they've always got their limitations. And Jesus does not have those limitations. And so I just want to remind you, and maybe for some of you it is the first time of hearing, that Jesus Christ is right there beside you, sharing in all that you share with right now, laughing when you laugh, being with you through those more challenging times, loving the things that you love. He is right there with you. And he will not ever disappear. He will not ever go and say, that's it. I'm off now. And then we have in uh, a bit further down in that chapter, we have uh, the people, Jesus saying to people, look, my teaching is not my own because they're thinking, well, this man's never been to Bible college. This man is, is, is un uneducated. How come to, he knows all of these things? And Jesus says, look, it, it doesn't come from me. This comes directly from God, from my father. And he's saying this, if anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak it on my own. In other words, he's saying, if anyone steps out in faith and does something that they believe that I am calling them to, if anyone steps out in faith and follows me and believes in my promises, then, then they'll know whether it's true or not because they will find that I am right there. And they will find the truth in the words I'm saying. And what he's saying is, you've got to do something first. You've got to step out in faith. Because then you will know that everything I'm telling you is true. And you know, that's, that's what it, life is like as a Christian. That we need to step out and find that Jesus is there on so many occasions. Do you know, there was a, a time uh, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, where I felt God calling me to do something. And it involved a huge financial risk. It meant that uh, our income was going to drop dramatically. 
And Karen has always been so much better than me at trusting God for money. But I knew that this was the time that I'd got to step out and believe in God's promises. And he, and we did. And he stepped up. And we got through that time. In fact, we got through that time quite comfortably. But sometimes we have to step out and we have to do what the things that Jesus is saying, live the life that he's, he's calling us to live. And then we find that his promises are true. Many years ago, I, I knew a girl who, who came, came from a very, very affluent background. But there was no love in her background. Financially, she came from a background that was, was very, very well off. But there was no love in her background. She knew no love from her parents. And uh, she reached a point where she just, she just couldn't take it anymore. And she went off and she took an overdose. Fortunately, somebody found her and brought her back before, uh, the, um, before anything terrible had happened to her. And she had, she had a stomach pump. Pumped. And she'd heard about Jesus. And I remember her telling me, she said, it was like stepping off a cliff. She said, she stepped out and she said, okay, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to live my life the way you want me to live. And if you're there, you're going to have to catch me because you know what this is going to do to my family relationships and my friendship relationships. And you're going to have to catch me. And he did. She stepped out. And she found the words of Jesus to be true. And what Jesus is saying, saying here is, trust me, take steps of faith and trust me and you will find that I am there. And it could be that for some of you today, Jesus is calling you to take a step of faith in whatever way. And he's saying, I'll look after you. I'll take good care of you. But this is what I want you to do. It could be that for some of you, you're being called to follow him. And he's saying, no, I want you to follow me. Trust me. Trust that I'll look after you. Trust that I'm with you. Trust that I'll carry you through any turbulence that may follow when you do this. Trust me and you'll know my promises are true. Do you know, we, we, my biggest fear about everything that we've been gone through, you know, as a, as a Baptist church, we've, we've gone through quite a lot. In fact, we're not going to really remember what, what it was like before, because we, uh, back at the, right at the beginning of October, we had our Harvest Festival. And we just about coped with the freshness of a church with no heating at that time. And then we decamped and we, we were welcomed down at St. James's. And then we were ready to come back here the very first Sunday of lockdown. And it may well be a year, turned it out to have been a year before we were, we actually are back in the chapel. It may be longer, maybe less, we, we don't know. But do you know what my biggest fear is? My biggest fear is that we will go back in the same church as we were back in October. My biggest fear for myself is that I'm going to come through this time and find that actually spiritually, I, I'm still the same person that I was before. I don't want to be. And I don't want us to be because I want us to have grown and to have gone forward. And do you know what that's going to take? That's going to take great faith. And we took a step of faith when we embarked on that building. And God, we found that God was there because £170,000 came in. Speaking to Colin Pye, our regional minister recently, he just could not believe it. But we stepped out and we found God was there. And I believe that God will be wanting us to step out more and more as a church and as individuals in the future. I want to pray that we are a different church because we've got greater faith. And then we have verse 23 where Jesus talks about circumcision. Now that's quite a painful uh, issue to talk about and uh, I don't want to go into too much detail but it was something that happened to um, uh, Jews circumcised their babies and it had to be done on the eighth day after the child was born and sometimes that fell on the Sabbath. Now the Jews have a law that you are not allowed to work on the Sabbath but they allowed circumcision on the Sabbath 
And Jesus is saying, you're fine with that. But you're not fine with me healing people on the Sabbath. You're fine with pain being inflicted on a baby on the Sabbath. But you're not fine with me taking away people's pain on the Sabbath. And, you know, Jesus was showing that people are more important to him. Our, our healing, our being made whole, is more important to him than anything else. And that he has a love for every one of us, which is so great. He wants to make it impossible for us not to love him back. And his love for us is more important than anything else. You are more important to Jesus Christ than anything else. And he wants you to become the person that he created you to be. He wants to take away your pain and he hurts. He wants to make you the person he created you to be. You know, a lot of people talk about getting back to normal. And I wonder what that means to you, to get back to normal. It might be thinking, yeah, that would be me meeting in the chapel. It might, think, it might be for you that it is being able to give people a hug instead of having to socially distance. You know, I phone people like Carlene and Frida up and say, look, I want you to know that I'm giving you a hug down the phone right now. Won't it be great when we don't have to do that anymore, when we can actually go out and give people hugs again? And maybe for you, that, that's what normality is. When we think about normality, we think about those kind of things that we're missing. Well, let me tell you that for God, normality is something different. Because normality for God goes way further back than March this year when regulations were introduced. It goes a long way further go back. It goes right back to Adam and Eve. It goes back to a time where Adam and Eve walked with God everywhere, where they talked with him all the time, where they were unashamed and unafraid of telling him everything, where they didn't hide. That was what was normal. A deep walk with the, with the Lord. That was normality. And do you know, I think that's the normality that God wants us to go back to. It's nothing to do with chapel buildings. It's nothing to do even with, with hugs and, and not having to socially distance anymore and being able to shop when we want and where we want when we need to. It's not about that. For God, normality is going back to a time when we walk with him and we share everything with him and we share every experience with him. Yesterday, I, I had to move the car and the radio came on and it was Graham Norton. Don't normally listen to the radio on Radio 2 on a Saturday morning, but there was Graham Norton talking to a nun, which rather took my breath away. And he was saying to her, so, so what do you do all the time? And she said, well, I, I pray most of the time. And he said, well, is that all? And she said, no, I read quite a lot. But then she said, when I'm reading, I, I'm praying as well. And, I, and I'm, I'm meditating on what God's saying to me through what it is I'm reading. But you know, that's normality. That is where we walk with God in every experience that we have. I'm not saying that, that you need to become nuns and monks. I've got the haircut for it, certainly. But I, I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that normality for God is where we share every experience with him. We don't try to hide anything from him. And we talk with him and we walk with him every step of the way. That is the normality that God wants us to come back to. You, back to. And are you willing to do that? It might be a big jump for us. And I don't think God expects us to make that big jump, but he does expect us to take steps and to let him lead. Because as it says in Joshua chapter three, verse four, you have never been this way before. I'd like us to be quiet for a moment. And I'd like you to pray how you need to pray. And I'm going to ask Holy Spirit that you minister to us all today. That you touch us now, Holy Spirit, as we're quiet and we lay ourselves before you.
maybe today you want to as you pray you want to say something like lord jesus i know that you're with me all of the time and sometimes i forget sometimes i can't sense you there but i believe in you and i want my faith to grow so that i will walk with you wherever you lead and i want to walk with you every step of the way and i want to include you in every area of my life because i'm yours and i want to follow you help my faith to grow amen going to listen to a song which uh, some of you may know it's a group by a group called city alight who i'd never heard of until somebody introduced me to them and it's a, a lovely song and it's called yet not i but through christ in me and whatever path jesus wants to take us on that our faith will grow so our faith will grow and so we, we take every step with him it may seem a challenge to us but that's because but when we include jesus he'll help us and he'll help us to overcome challenges that we can't overcome ourselves yet not i but through christ in me what gift of grace is jesus my
Father God, as we go now, we pray that we will know your presence with us in all that we do. May we know your peace and your joy in our hearts. And may we live with you as you want us to live with you. Amen. Thank you, everyone. And um, I'm just going to go and put the kettle on and then I'll be back in a moment with my coffee. Thank you, Peter. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much, Peter. Lovely morning. <laughs>